Welcome to worship at Emmanuel Lutheran, those joining us in person and those joining us online. In worship today, we focus on the gift of prayer, or maybe all the more, what do we do when things are against us, when the pains and troubles are building up? What do we do when we pray and it doesn't seem like God's answering? Our Lord tells us to pray again, to persist in prayer, and to do that with confidence that he does hear and that for Jesus' sake, he will answer, he will bless you. We begin with a hymn that reminds us to begin each day with prayer. Hymn 776, With the Lord Begin Your Task. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us, according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory be. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God, our refuge and strength, have mercy on your church as we come in prayer before you. Answer us not in judgment on our sins, but in peace and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, and again, we are encouraged to cry out to God, even in the most dire circumstances, especially at those times. Our first lesson will be the basis for the sermon today. Jacob, of the Old Testament, had sinned. He'd stolen something very important from his brother, and now his brother was coming to meet him. Jacob was afraid, but the Lord came and strengthened him. We read from Genesis 32. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The choir will sing its anthem. My lips will shout for joy.
Our second scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 5. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation and the gospel of our Lord. gospel according to St. Luke chapter 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Our hymn of the day is a new hymn, 724. Be still my soul before the Lord. Again, about the gift of prayer. The choir will sing the first stanza. We'll join them in singing the rest. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The portion of the word we're looking at in detail is our first reading from Genesis chapter 32. Fellow children, 
of our Savior God. Jacob thought he was going to die. His brother Esau was coming with a bunch of his men, like a, a small army that was going to come and meet him. Twenty years earlier, Jacob had stolen something from his brother. That is, he tricked their father Isaac into giving him, Jacob, the blessing that was due to the firstborn son. Esau had promised revenge on Jacob. Well, now Esau was coming 20 years later, along with 400 of his men. Jacob was terrified. And then the Lord came to him. The Lord came to him in the form of this mysterious man who wrestled with Jacob all night long and finally at the end blessed Jacob. Blessed him with the certainty that no matter how scary might, things might be, the Lord was with him. And the Lord would continue to be with him. The Lord promises to be with us. No matter how scary, no matter how painful our lives may be. And God wants us then to do just as Jacob did. To turn to him in prayer. To wrestle with him. To wrestle with God in prayer. In the certainty that he hears and he blesses. Now, go back 20 years before our count. Jacob had stolen his brother's birthright, and then he had run away to his uncle Laban's house in order to try to stay safe. The Lord came to Jacob in a dream as he was going to assure him that he, God, was going to be with Jacob for years to come. He would be blessed, and Jacob was richly blessed. Over those 20 years, he got huge flocks of animals, many servants, 11 children, and two wives. Maybe you recall the story about how Uncle Laban tricked Jacob into marrying the two sisters, Leah and Rachel. Yes, Jacob was blessed. He became rich. And now, after 20 years, God told him it was time to go back home, back to Canaan. Along the way, Jacob was assured by God that he was with him. In fact, Jacob got to see two groups of angels that were accompanying him and his family as they made this, this 400-mile trip back to their home. But then Jacob heard that Esau was coming, along with all of these servants of his, and Jacob was terrified. So Jacob prayed. You can look back earlier in Genesis 32 and read Jacob's prayer. It's one of the best prayers in all of Scripture. Jacob thanked God for all the blessings he'd poured upon his life. He said he was unworthy of any of these blessings that God had given him. And yet he then dared to ask for more because God had promised to be with him. And so Jacob asked him to now be with him and to protect him at this time. Well, after another long night when nothing seemed to happen, Jacob then did what seemed to be best to him. He sent some gifts across to his brother Esau, 220 goats, and then 220 sheep, and then 30 camels, and then 40 cows, and 10 bulls, and 30 donkeys, one gift after another sent with some, some servants in order to try to soften him up. It seemed like Jacob was doing everything he could to try to make up with his brother at this time. First of all, Jacob prayed. And then he prayed again and again. And then Jacob came up with this plan to calm his brother's anger. This wasn't wrong. God says that while we depend upon him, he also often works through what we do in order to accomplish his will and even to protect us too. When we're sick, when we're facing some evil, we trust in God. But that doesn't mean that we do all that we can in order to resolve the situation. If you are sick, pray to God to heal you. But also, take your medicine, use the technology, listen to the doctors and all the rest, and recognize that God will work through them for your good. Yes, pray to God to protect your family financially, but also work hard and invest your money wisely. And do that confident that God is actually going to use your efforts in order to help take care of your family. You likely remember that old story about the man at the church at the time of the flood. A man was there at the church, and the flood waters were rising. And some members came in the boat, and they said to him, Okay, get in the boat. We're going to be saved here. And the man said, No, nope, I'm going to pray to God, and God will take care of me. 
The waters kept rising. He had to climb, climb on furniture, and eventually start climbing up there on the, on the outside of the church. Some people came in the motorboat and said, get in, swim here, over here, we'll take care of you. And the man said, no, he was going to keep praying to God. God would save him. The waters kept rising. He had to go all the way up on the roof. He kept praying to God. A helicopter came. The rescue worker shouted down to him, grab hold of the ladder. And the man said, no, I'm praying to God, and God will take care of me. Eventually, the man drowned, and he went to heaven. And he asked God, I prayed to you. I kept praying to you. Why didn't you deliver me? And God said, well, who do you think sent those two boats and the helicopter? Yes, we should pray. We should pray when we're facing a great challenge, but also use your brain. Accept help, but also do what you can. Do your can and make your plans in order to fix the situation. Jacob did what he could, and Jacob prayed. And then he found himself all alone at night, or at least he thought he was alone, when suddenly this man shows up, a man who starts to wrestle with him. And they wrestle all night long. And it's a standoff. This man wasn't using his full strength. This man was simply wrestling with Jacob to test him, to see would he give up, would he abandon, or would he keep going. And Jacob would not give up. Finally, the man touched Jacob's hip. They're wrenching his hip out of joint, which would have been a reminder to Jacob for the rest of his life of what had happened that night. So here Jacob is. Now he's in pain. He can't keep wrestling, but he just grabs hold of the man because he recognized who this man was. This was the Lord God. This was God who loved him, God who had promised to protect him, promised to take care of him, who was now wrestling him with him in order to test his faith. Jacob grabbed hold of him and insisted that the Lord would bless him. Does it seem sometimes to you that God is inflicting pain on you? Or maybe just to ask the question more generally, why do we suffer here in this world? Well, the Bible suggests several answers. For one thing, you could ask, why does a parent discipline his or her children? It's not because they hate the children. It's because they love the children. It's to help that child realize when they've done something wrong, admit what they've done, and then be forgiven of what they've done, and then be reminded not to fall into that temptation again. God disciplines us through his sorrows, like a loving father disciplines his children. God also leads our pains to lead us closer to him, to lead us to pray to him. When you're facing a challenge, a real struggle, and there's no other way out, that's one way God reminds you to say, hey, stop and talk to him as maybe you could have done before. Pray to him at those circumstances. He's the one who made your body. He's the one who protects you, who gives you breath every day. God also uses our problems to give other people a chance to serve. Remember that, not just when you're in the flood and the floodwaters are coming and they're in the boat. Remember that when you're in the hospital. God is using this to give all those good people a chance to serve, to serve you and to serve him. And the Lord may have other purposes for our pains too. But one reason that is not true for why we suffer, God is not punishing us. We know that because of what Jesus did. Jesus, God himself, came to this earth and lived among us, and then he suffered. He was arrested. He was beaten. He finally went to the cross, and he did that all in our place. It was, he was beaten like we should have been beaten. He was rejected like we should have been rejected. He was killed as we deserve to be killed in order to pay the price for all of our sins. So God does not punish us. Instead, for Jesus' sake, God uses our trials in this life for our good, uses them to bring us closer to him, even the pains, even the sorrows of this world. What about, you might say, when it seems that God is not helping, when you pray to God and he doesn't seem to be answering? Well, then remember our gospel today. Jesus told that little story about the woman who'd had some deep injustice against her. She went to the judge, an evil man, and finally, after she kept going to him, kept persisting, finally he gave in just to stop listening to her problems. And the, remember the point of that. 
If that's what an evil person would do, just think how much God will help you. The Lord who loves you. The Lord who sent his son to die for you, to save you. That Lord God is going to be with you. He will deliver you in his own time, in his own way, as he knows is best. So keep praying to him. Look at Jacob. He prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally in his pain, he grabbed hold of God. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Jacob, well, there's a name with some history. You may remember the name means the heel grabber. It goes back to his birth. Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau was born first, and Jacob was born grabbing hold of his brother's heel at that time. Jacob lived up to his name. As a young man, he tricked his brother into treating his birthright pretty frivolously, and later on, he tricked his father Isaac into giving him again the blessing that was due to Esau. What is your name? Jacob? That name meant an awful lot. Jacob, the heel grabber, the one who steals and lies and cheats to get his way. He had to acknowledge his own trickery. That was why, of course, he was in this predicament in the first place with his brother. And now he recognized that the only way out would be if God would bless him. So he held on demanding that blessing. The Lord leads each of us to recognize how we are Jacob when we so often want to do things our way, even push other people out of the way to get our own things, and then the Lord changes us. The man said to him, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with man have, and have overcome this new name, Israel, it would be given to Jacob and it would then be applied to all of his descendants, the Israelites here upon this earth. And that would be a constant reminder of how God the Holy Spirit had changed his life. How God had changed him from being the heel grabber to being one who would trust in the Lord. No longer would he have to rely upon his own cleverness to overcome all of his problems. He would become one who would be persistent in clinging to God, fighting in order to win God's blessing, and then receiving that blessing. Receiving that blessing again and again. With his Savior God's promise ringing in his ears now, this new name, Israel was ready to meet his brother Esau and ready for whatever might come in that new day. The lessons that Jacob learned are lessons that we need to learn again and again. Because in his amazing love, the Almighty God came to Jacob, allowed him to wrestle with him and, and wrestle those blessings, we might say, right out of his hand. And God wants the same thing from us. God didn't want Jacob to be timid in asking for his blessings, and he doesn't want us to be timid either, but rather to come to him boldly. In fact, God was rejoicing when Jacob wrestled with him, when Jacob clung to him and then gained that blessing. And God rejoices when we are persistent, when we continue to cling to him, insisting on his blessing. And just like God gave Jacob a new name, God has given you a new name too. In holy baptism, God said, you are my child. You are now a brother or sister of Jesus Christ. You now have the name Christian. Your sins are washed away. And you can be certain that not only is there a home waiting for you in heaven, you can be certain that God is with you, with you every day upon this earth. So you can turn to him boldly, as boldly and confidently as dear children come to their father, their loving father. You have a father who will hear you every time you stop and pray to him. One of the greatest treasures that we have is this gift of prayer, the confidence to speak to God, the confidence to know that he hears us, the confidence, like Jacob, to come boldly and confidently asking God to do exactly what he's promised to take care of us, to bless us, especially blessing us spiritually, and being certain that we will win that blessing, that God will bless us richly each and every day of our lives. It's interesting that from this point on, Genesis chapter 32, as you read in the Bible, Jacob is sometimes called Jacob and sometimes called Israel. And that's probably a reminder that sometimes he acted like Israel, trusting in God completely, 
And sometimes he acted like Jacob, that sinful man. Just like you and uh, me, we are all sinners and saints. And that, again, is why we need to go back and wrestle with God as we confess our sins to him each and every day, repent of what we've done, and then we're assured by him once again that we're forgiven, that we are his children now and forever for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, wrestle. Wrestle with God in prayer as he wants you to do, and then receive all the blessings that God has stored up for you. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses our understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith in what the Lord has done as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In the prayer of the church, we'll include petitions on behalf of Larry Schaller, who's in the hospital recovering from blood poisoning. He also has other health issues afflicting him. He'll probably be in there for another week. We pray on behalf of Laura Bennett, who will be undergoing carpal tunnel surgery this coming week. Pastor Aaron Strong of Grace Lutheran in Milwaukee died in a car accident this week. Some of our members knew him. We pray for his family and his congregation. And Shelby Blue was a local resident who died in a car accident. She was a friend of some of our members. We pray for her family also. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, the righteous call to you day and night, and you answer them quickly. Grant us faith to rest secure in your mercy and justice as we await the coming of the Son of Man. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have caused the sacred writings of your word to be proclaimed through all generations. Encourage and strengthen parents to teach their word to their children, that your people may be trained in righteousness and equipped for every good work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of all, grant justice to those who suffer wrong. Give wisdom and understanding to the leaders of all nations, especially our own, that they may punish evil and reward good, fearing God and respecting people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, because you neither slumber nor sleep, deliver us from evil. Especially we beg you to protect the lives of those who face sickness, injuries, and troubles, including Larry Schaller and Laura Bennett. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the one who gives us all of our days. Our days are in your hands. We ask that you would be with the family of Pastor Aaron Strong in Wisconsin and bless them with the certainty of the resurrection to come. Be with all the members of that church, too, and continue to comfort them at this time with the certainty of your presence. Lord, we also pray on behalf of the family of Shelby Blue, we ask that you would bless them again with the certainty of your presence and strengthen them with the certainty that in you there is forgiveness, in you there is life. Therefore, we can look forward to being with you eternally. Gracious Lord, you desire that we come to you in prayer and not lose heart in the midst of suffering. As we struggle with many afflictions in this veil of tears, strengthen us by the suffering and cross of your Son. Have mercy on us when our spirits fail and we are overwhelmed by despair. Renew our faith by the proclamation of the gospel to cry to you in hope day and night. You are our keeper. Guard us when death draws near and grant that we would be found faithful on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
If you're here, please sign one of the friendship cards or the friendship register before you leave. Online, you could go to the description link and sign in. We'll keep you informed of things at Emmanuel. You can leave an offering at our church or go to our website to support our ministry. We continue our worship with hymn 723, When in the Hour of Utmost Need. Please stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that, being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We conclude with hymn 835, Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
God's blessing to all of you once again, those joining us online too. May you be all the more certain of God's love and all the more ready to turn to him and pray in all circumstances. Thank you to our choir and organist, others beautifying the worship today. We have um, a trunk or treat today at 1.30, and everybody's invited to come to that if you would like to. So that'll be a joyous time for us to get together for that too. And uh, also in a few weeks, we have an open house for our preschool. You can sign up and back for that November 6th. Uh, preschool children will be singing at our late service that day, so that'll be a great time. But sign up if you would. We'll have a luncheon afterwards then. We have the Wells Connection, I think, ready to show for us for today, talking about working with youth. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Ministry to the young people of our synod is more important than ever. They're surrounded by a culture that's directly opposed to the beliefs and values they've learned since they were children. That presents them and those who minister to them with some real challenges. But no matter how difficult it may be, we know how vital it is to nurture the faith of a young person. One way that happens on a large scale is at the Wells International Youth Rally. As more than 2,000 young people gathered for worship, for instruction in God's word, and, oh yeah, more than a little fun and fellowship. I think it's awesome so far. It's awesome. I really like it. That's two out of three. You got 30 seconds each round. Ready? There's certainly no shortage of excitement and enthusiasm at the Wells International Youth Rally, which returned this year to the University of Tennessee. I absolutely love it. I love how they have the bouncy houses because honestly it matches my personality. But it's not all just fun and games at this largest regular gathering of Wells members. This year, there were over 2,000 attendees. Coyne did a great job and then Pastor Westra, man, his message was powerful. We join together as God's children. We confess the Christian faith that lives in our hearts. I love, like, when we sing all together. It's so nice. I love it so much. I love just hearing everybody praising God together. When I think of the Wells Youth Rally, it's all these young people that are wondering who else is out there that believes the same things, and to look around this stadium and see their family in Jesus, and to be able to just make connections, whatever kind of connections they can make, they make, and just celebrate being Christians together, and celebrate having that true word of God and sharing that bond with each other. This four-day event gives teens the chance to be spiritually fed through worship and small group workshops and encouraged through the fellowship of gathering with so many others their age who share their faith. What I really appreciate about a teen event, having all of our teens be able to come from our congregations gathered together because not every teen goes to a Christian high school. And just being a part of a community where they are surrounded by like-minded Christians. With this being a biennial event, however, there's a large gap of time between each youth rally. Four days of heightened, exciting spiritual nourishment and encouragement, and then everyone goes their separate ways. We don't just want it to be an experience at a cool place. We want to equip them. Uh, we want to equip those that are called and those that are willing to lead them and, and deal with them at such a critical time in their ministry. To assist local churches in encouraging the teens of their congregation between youth rallies, the Wells Commission on Discipleship is offering resources to help keep that fire going. The first is video-based materials that youth group leaders can use to plan this type of ministry. The other is a kit for putting on youth nights. Think of these youth nights as a youth rally experience that happens on the local level. The kit is a blueprint that local congregations can adapt and make their own to best fit their ministry setting. 
It is to, to bring about that, that sense of God's people getting together. It, it's not just necessarily kids from your own church. It's welcoming, it's inviting, it's getting kids from different areas and, and different places to maybe then sit down and to experience God's grace and to gather around his word uh, with other people that they might not often do. Adolescence is such a critical moment in the spiritual lives of Christians. These teens are coming of age at a time in history when Christianity is under attack, when following Christ doesn't seem to be what's trending. Whatever the different issues are that's facing them that my generation, you know, I don't even know. Uh, I, it's so new to me even, and, and I've seen a lot. Um, just to let them know you're not alone, and you're the here and now. Having so much fun and knowing that everybody like believes in the same stuff as me is so awesome. I cringe a little bit when I hear people say that the young people of our synod are the future. They are not just the future of our synod. They are the here and now of our synod. And I hope that they go back and say, hey, I am the now, get me plugged in. I wanna be active, I wanna be a part of church. I wanna be a part of outreach. I wanna be a part of building God's family and his community. We hope to see you at the next Wells International Youth Rally in 2024 at Colorado State University, where we'll be celebrating 50 years of equipping and encouraging our youth. In the meantime, resources for connecting with young people at your church can be found at wellscongregationalservices.net. We actually, there is a Wells Youth Night. We invited our youth to go to next weekend in Columbus, and we've been talking to the folks at Trinity Engineer about maybe doing a Wells Youth Night here also in sometime in the, in the next few months. So good opportunity, good encouragement that we have there to encourage our youth. God be with all of you, and whatever stage of life you're in, continue to bless you richly. And again, if you want to come back for Trunk or Treat later today, you can do that at 1.30. Please greet everyone here.